Hello and welcome to Best of the Day. I'm Dr. Christy Russell from the University of Southern California and I'm here at the 2013 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and I'm interviewing four separate uh, thought leaders in the field of breast cancer during these meetings on some of the uh, dis the better abstracts um, in different groupings that are being presented here. And today we're going to talk about the abstracts related to hormone therapy or hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And I've asked Dr. Bill Gratishar to join me here. Bill is professor of medicine at Northwestern University. And thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank me. you for inviting me, Christy. So I think uh, to me, feels a little weak this year um, in the breast cancer arena. No huge randomized trials. But the first one that was presented um, was Jack Kuzik, who presented the IBIS-2 trial and also apparently published online uh, today um, in Lancet. So um, can you walk us through that trial, who the patients were who were involved sure, in some of the sure. outcomes? So just even a, a step back initially, the, the background for this trial, as most of the listeners know, is there's a series of trials over the last decade and a half that demonstrated SERMs are effective at reducing women at risk of developing breast cancer. Uh, it markedly reduces their risk. So we had the tamoxifen trials, uh, both in the U.S. and elsewhere, that showed that versus placebo. We had tamoxifen versus raloxifene that demonstrated efficacy of both agents in reducing risk. And then we had exemestane versus placebo, uh, also demonstrating a benefit from aromatase inhibitor in postmenopausal women at risk of developing breast cancer. So we have clearly have proof of principle that this notion of using CIRMs or other endocrine agents reduces risk. Um, this trial, the IBIS-2 trial, was a comparison of anastrozole, commercially known as Arimidex, but anastrozole versus placebo in postmenopausal women deemed to be at risk of developing breast cancer. And sort of cutting to the chase, what the trial reaffirmed is very similar to what other experiences have reported that you get a marked reduction in the risk of developing breast cancer. It was in excess of 50 percent and in fact DCIS being reduced by about 70 percent. And the effect, as was seen in other trials, is predominantly in ER positive breast cancer. That's where the reduction was seen uh, most strikingly, not so much in the ER negative disease. So uh, this result reaffirms all the other trials. Now some of the more interesting things in many ways were a careful look at the side effect profiles. So we've all often associated AIs, aromatase inhibitors, exemestane, letrozole, and astrozole with musculoskeletal complaints. And this is one of the reasons that many people are said to discontinue the drugs because they develop these problems. So they were very critical in assessing musculoskeletal complaints and found that in reality, even though many people in both arms of this trial developed those problems or complaints, those that could be attributed directly to the AI were only about 10 percent of patients, meaning, of course, that over the course of the trial in this age group, many people have aches and pains. So it was about equal and, you know, there was a 10 percent more with the AI. So we shouldn't uh, necessarily attribute uh, the complaints that a patient has re regarding musculoskeletal complaints automatically to the AI. The other thing that was important is that the fracture rate was about the same. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing that I would say about it is the compliance diminished over time with both arms, which is an observation with any oral agent given over a long period of time. But the important thing was the difference between placebo and the AI was only about 5%. So there wasn't an excess discontinuation of one treatment versus the other in this trial, again, basically reaffirming that there wasn't a huge dropout rate for the uh, anastrozole. I think what's interesting about the overview and all of the trials we've seen on the use of hormone therapies is the understanding of the, the dropout and the lack of adherence to the medication, and despite that, the huge benefit that's being seen. And, and the presumption that if you could take every patient and have them be completely adherent for all five years whether there'd be a 70% reduction or right. you know, much greater than 50, but reality is that people aren't staying on these drugs. Yeah, and Don Hirschman, who gave a, uh, a talk that was completely sort of unrelated to what we're talking about, has done a lot of the work with compliance. And you know, she's made the observation, whether you're talking about tamoxifen, whether you're talking about an AI, the noncompliance rate is striking. And, and uh, to your point, 
if we could either convince people to continue or have therapies that they feel comfortable in taking or have maneuvers of getting around the side effects, the impact of these drugs on reducing risk of developing breast cancer would be probably profound. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, w with all of these data that are out there now with the CIRMs, with these two AIs, Clearly, we don't have approval in the United States for prevention of either XMSA nor anastrozole right now. Where, where do you think the role is because of the complete underuse of the CIRMs for prevention? Right. So I think that, um, you know, we, we, we were talking about this after the presentation, and I think in order to really uh, impact or up, get an uptick in the use of these drugs, it's not really conveying the message to us as medical oncologists because we're not the ones that see these women. They're mm -hmm. not patients. They're women with uh, an increased risk of developing breast cancer. There's always been some hesitancy on the part of primary care physicians to fiddle with cancer drugs and the concern about the complaints and side effects. So I think that's one target population, the, the caregivers, that have to be educated. And then, of course, since we're so good at uh, direct marketing everything directly to patients, I think patients have to understand the potential benefit of these drugs and the importance of compliance and adherence if you actually do go on them. We've always, um, I don't know what your practice is, when you have a patient with DCIS and for some reason she can't take tamoxifen, there's, let's say she's had a mastectomy, so this is truly risk reduction for the contralateral breast. We've sort of been stuck with using the CIRMs because we don't have data essentially around the aromatase inhibitors. Do you think now showing this very significant reduction in new DCIS, this helps you in any way? Well, it does. I think it gives you cover in a, in a sense. Um, you know, there's clearly a rationale based on these data why one would consider that. So if, if you were really wedded in an individual patient to the idea of using prevention, it's the right thing to do and they're, they can't take tamoxifen or raloxifene or whatever, then, you know, I think an AI would be a reasonable choice based on these data. Um, you know, if you said, is it approved for that purpose? No. But, it, again, if it's the individual patient where you think this is going to help them, I think it's reasonable. Now, with the MAP3, um, you know, the Pfizer or whoever was producing XMS data at the time, um, could easily have gone to the FDA to get approval for this. They did not. Do you, do you foresee because both these drugs are generic that will never get approval and this will always be off-label use of an aromatase inhibitor? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who the champion is going to be of a generic drug. Right. Um, and I don't know that there is a pathway to approval and who would undertake that. Um, so I, I've got a feeling that your suggestion that this may be off-label use is probably correct because mm -hmm. there's, there's really non-incentive for anyone. And I don't think some generic company is going to go investing in getting it approved, right. making the drug and selling it. Regardless, I think uh, the, the data that were presented in the, in the Lancet and, and today, I think um, at least oncologists who are familiar with that should uh, consider taking on reading that article and really understanding the particulars about how they chose women to be at high risk and um, and the actual benefit. But I think it's another drug and it's another proof of principle with the aromatase inhibitors have really strong potential efficacy here in this circumstance. Right. Exactly. The, the next, um, there were two presentations that then were uh, subsequently given um, around the, actually three, around the issue of aromatase inhibitors, getting back to the issues of adherence, noncompliance, toxicity. And the first one was by... Um, Henry et al., and it was um, associations between baseline symptoms and eventual noncompliance. So baseline symptoms of arthralgias or other issues, um, and then they start an AI and their compliance. Can you talk about that? Right. Study? So in the past, we've had data that suggested that if you had still residual effects from chemotherapy and then went on to an AI, that often was a predictor of uh, noncompliance, nonadherence, early discontinuation of an AI. And you know, we also have this notion that we were talking about a bit earlier that when you take an AI that you're going to develop all these symptoms, particularly musculoskeletal complaints. And as clinicians, we think if we were predicting without any other information, we'd say, what's the most likely reason a woman's going to come off? We'd say that. Mm -hmm. So I think these investigators wanted to 
establish a very clear baseline of what things or what complaints patients had before going on to an AI and then correlate those things with uh, discontinuation rates going forward as patients were on therapy. And what they looked at uh, were a series of instruments, quality of life instruments, uh, measures of different side effects over a period of a year uh, periodically and then also came back at uh, the 24-month period. But the real period of time they were looking at was that one-year period. So they looked at a large group of patients, and these were patients who were actually in a pharmacogenomic study, uh, but they were either getting exemestane or letrozole. Some had prior, previously gotten tamoxifen before going on to one of the AIs. And they tracked the patients with respect to all kinds of things, musculoskeletal complaints, um, difficulty with sleeping, difficulty with concentrating, uh, all these sorts of things. And actually, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the complaints that fell out as reasons why patients were most likely to discontinue the drug were things like fatigue, uh, you know, this notion that they're not thinking as clearly, uh, not so much the musculoskeletal complaints, and sort of, you know, some depressive symptoms, et cetera. So the basic message is, number one, it may not be what we think, that it's going to be aches and pains that take patients off, but rather a constellation of other symptoms that we may not always think about so clearly, uh, you know, feeling fatigue, feeling like you're not thinking clearly, et cetera. And the message from the, the presenter was that we probably at the outset have to identify these issues in patients and really have a concerted effort to focus on the constellation as opposed to an individual thing, uh, particularly if we're looking at long-term compliance with the therapy over five or perhaps longer durations depending on an individual patient. Yeah, I thought it wasn't that patients necessarily had um, more sleep disturbance when they took the medication. They came in with sleep disturbance. It was a continuous problem through the medication. And when they came off, they didn't blame the sleep disturbance for the problem. They tended to blame musculoskeletal events, but in fact, it was people coming in with all of these symptoms that led them to be non-adherent to the medication. Yeah, it's sort of the idea that, in a way, the medication has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's that you have to address totally unrelated problems to their cancer, to the medications, you know, and, you know, it's almost like a primary care wellness thing you have to focus on optimizing that before you put a patient on any of these medications, otherwise they'll come off. Right. Very, very fascinating to me, although it's not that we have a bucket full of um, plans on how to deal with these symptoms. I mean, you know, we frequently will have patients who are have mild depression and sleep disturbance and can't concentrate after chemotherapy. They talk about chemo brain and all that sort of thing, but you know, we can talk about placing them an, on antidepressants with all of its constellation of side effects. It's it's, a, to me, a little bit of an interesting dilemma, but I think it's eye-opening for us to at least walk in with those conversations with the patients. You're right, exactly. So the, the next um, trial was an exercise trial. It's called the HOPE study, um, and uh, done looking at the um, effect of a pretty intensive exercise program uh, versus usual exercise in women who are on an aromatase inhibitor. Can you, can you talk about this study? Right, so the idea was, again, getting back to what our primary thought is, what's the complaint patients complain about? Aches and pains, arthralgias, et cetera. So could exercise as an intervention potentially diminish pain scores? That was sort of the question hypothesis. So the way the trial was designed uh, was there was a group of women that were taking aromatase inhibitors randomized to usual whatever, their usual activity versus exercise, which basically looked at, you know, some weight-bearing exercise for a couple hours uh, a week, you know, try to actually sort of the standard recommendation for anybody, whether you're on an aromatase inhibitor or not, or sort of left to your own devices, you do what you want. And sort of the interesting thing, of course, is was pointed out by the presenter is that even in the usual, once they know they're in an exercise program, there's a slight uptick in the amount of exercise the people who didn't do exercise right. actually conducted each week. But the patients who did exercise, um, they confirmed that they were actually doing it by looking at their body mass index, which did decline a little bit. And it should be pointed out that to a large extent, the women who participated in this were uh, white women, overweight, 
A lot of that reflects, you know, American population right. on an aromatase inhibitor postmenopausal. And they uh, confirmed it by a decrease in body mass index for the patients who actually got the exercise. And then they also did VMAX. So they found that their exercise capacity had actually increased, which was, you know, a, a solid indicator that they were actually doing something. And they found that in the patients who exercise that their most severe pain on the uh, pain index scores was reduced uh, by taking exercise as opposed to those who did not. So I think this, again, speaks to the uh, merits of doing some sort of exercise on a consistent basis, and it may overcome some of the symptoms that patients often attribute to an aromatase inhibitor. Yeah, I think it, it was just a reminder of the, the current recommendations around physical activity for healthy Americans, which is about two and a half hours a week of moderate to strenuous exercise. This is not mild strolling around every once in a while or walking the dog. I mean, the recommendations, although they've been out there for a while, pretty much are not heeded by the majority of Americans. And um, I think it's a, a matter for all of us taking care of these patients to maybe have in our back pocket the list of places they can go to to sign up or that they're in, the, the institution that that you're working at or in the neighborhood that there there are these programs. Right, and on so many levels, uh, whether you're focused on your heart, your lungs, your breasts, whatever, exercise has been consistently shown to be helpful in making you more healthy. So this was pain scale, but you got to think about the prior abstract when people walking in with sleep disturbance and lack of concentration and that sort of thing they would presumably be helped a lot by exercise Sure. As well. I mean, all of those symptoms uh, in unrelated studies have been shown to improve or diminish um, with exercise. Right. So. so I think although we're still searching for the appropriate treatment for all the arthralgias and myalgias that are, are being reported, um, I think right now exercise seems to be the number one thing that um, at least... Um, objectively had significant reduction in pain scores. And of all the things we do, probably the cheapest intervention there, <laughs> there is. Go. There you <laughs> yeah, go. Right. Very good. Um, and then lastly in this group of um, presentation with Don Hirschman, um, presenting data um, on drug usage or prescription usage and comparing women who are on generic tamoxifen brand name aromatase inhibitor and generic aromatase inhibitors over time points um, and adherence to the medications. Yeah, so I think that was an effort to look at whether or not the availability broadly of most of these drugs being generic now had any impact on adherence. And she also looked at, you know, cost of drugs, which actually I again find striking, you know, the uh, generally the numbers are something like, uh, you know, a generic AI is a hundred bucks a month. Uh, uh, brand name 300 a month, and at the other end of the extreme, something that we partner in some patients with metastatic disease, a drug like Everolimus is 9,000 plus a month, which is, you know, absolutely striking. Um, but her basic uh, thesis was that once these drugs became generic, so in theory less out-of-pocket cost, was there greater adherence? And there was actually a demonstration that uh, as opposed to brand name, there was an improvement in adherence. And similarly, if you look at the amount of copay a patient had to make uh, in order to get the drug, uh, as that was higher, there was more uh, non-compliance. So I think that as patients are less stressed about the cost of the drug that they're expected to take, it's just one more thing that allows them to be more compliant with the drug. What I found when these drugs became generic and doing having to do a crossover for patients from brand to generic is there's always a pushback from patients. Yes, they were paying huge amount of money for the, the brand drugs, but they're worried that the generic is ineffective. So it was what she they did not look at were patients that switched from one to the other. They just looked at different points in time right. in terms of adherence. And I think that helped get rid of this perception that patients have uh, around that issue. Right, that was a very common concern that patients expressed a few years ago. Right, although I still have patients who insist on brand yeah. drug yeah. E even yeah. now. Yeah, right. exactly.
And then finally, there was um, a presentation of um, using a, a drug called desatinib with letrozole. So for all of our patients with metastatic breast cancer, we know they're going to become resistant to endocrine therapy, and we're looking for partnering uh, drugs. Uh, you already mentioned Everolimus, which has approval, but partnering drugs to try to either extend the period of time of responsiveness to a hormone therapy or to overcome resistance. So the, the one presentation of this group is a co drug called desatinib. If you could talk about the drug sure. a little bit yeah. and then the trial. So this idea of partner, you know, for in the endocrine arena for many years, the whole idea is let's develop a new endocrine drug. There was tamoxifen, there's, you know, the, the progestins, there's the aromatase inhibitors, there's fulvestrant, and then it stopped. You know, we haven't seen anything new in terms of a clear new anti-hormonal therapy. And I'm not really aware of anything that's on the cusp of you know, approval anywhere. So where the focus has always been in the last few years is how can we partner existing drugs with other uh, compounds that may interact with a node along the signaling pathway, whether we're talking about HER2 disease, whether we're talking about anti-hormonal therapy. And to that end, you mentioned exemestane and the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus. That partnership results in more progression-free survival, and that's what led to its approval. We have a Pfizer drug, a CDK inhibitor that's being combined with an aromatase inhibitor and the early results show marked improvement in time to disease progression. So again, uh, coming at the signaling pathway in two different ways. And then today, we heard about desatinib, which is a SARC inhibitor, which in previous trials hasn't been all that exciting or even for that matter in other settings where we've used it. But in this particular trial, in first-line treatment of metastatic breast cancer, ER-positive postmenopausal, a randomized phase two trial design, patients either got the aromatase inhibitor alone or the aromatase inhibitor plus desatinib. And although it's small and there's caveats and it's limited, there was a striking difference in PFS time to disease progression of uh, more than double for the addition of desatinib, something like 20 versus nine months. And it was interesting as well because there wasn't a marked difference in response rate. So it, it lends itself to the issue of why is it that, you know, although the responses are the same, those getting the desatinib continue without disease progression for such a long, long time. So it makes those responses that patients do experience all that much more uh, stable over time. That would be one interpretation. Um, so you know, again, with the addition of the satinib 2 and AI, you are buying a little bit more in the way of toxicity. But for that potential gain in time to disease progression, one would hope that you can manage those side effects because that amount of benefit is pretty striking. Right. I think that um, what struck me is actually the response rates to the frontline aromatase inhibitor were higher than I would have expected. It was in the 70% yeah. range. And Although that is our first drug out there, that feels like a really high response rate, although it's a randomized phase two. I mean, they saw that on both arms. Right. Um, but to get 20 months out of your first therapy as a median is a long time. Randomized phase two, and we'll have to see whether the company's interested in really exploring this as a phase three in this circumstance right. or not. Right, right. Exciting stuff. Yeah, exactly. So um, thank you. I appreciate your uh, spending time talking about the, uh, the presentations on hormone therapy here at uh, San Antonio. And thank you for joining me for the um, best of the day for the 2013 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Again, I have three other interviews um, that are going on here, and I, I hope you'll tune into those as well. Thank you.